Hello and welcome to Behind the Bearcat. This is the podcast where the Northwest Missouri State University Career Services Office chats with Northwest faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends to hear their career journeys, how they got to where they are, and how they became Bearcats. I'm Career Services Assistant Director Travis Klein. And I'm Hannah Christian, Director of Career Services here at Northwest. And today's guest on our show is... Christian Dixon. I am our annual giving specialist with the University Advancement Team, and I'm so happy to be on the Behind the Bearcat podcast. It's, it's an honor. All right. Welcome. Well, welcome. welcome. Yes, yeah, so you've been on the list. Yeah. I think this is like your second job. <laughs> you've been on the list for people we want to have on. So we okay, find, I can, we I can finally caught up with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that just gives us more to talk about. Absolutely. So, perfect. Perfect. So let's start for you. Let's start with um, annual giving specialist. Tell us what does that mean? What what duties of the job? Sort of what what role you have? Just anything. Okay, absolutely. So this is really my first month in this position. It's a pretty new uh, opportunity, and it's been very exciting so far. So annual giving, um, we are doing sort of the um, touch point campaigns for alumni and friends of the university. Um, so we're doing the calls, we're doing the texts, we're doing the emails. Um, we we structure those at the start of every academic year. Um, and then we have prospects that are kind of meeting different criteria that we that we reach out to. And uh, I run the outreach center here at the uh, the Faust Center for Alumni and Friends. And uh, we we have Bearcat callers who are student employees that I supervise. And uh, during my time as a student, I was a student employee for a lot of different things. And I can touch on that a little bit later. But I think it's really important for, for current students to be able to be the face of Northwest um, when you're interacting with alumni um, or just different stakeholders uh, across the board there. Um, so we have really just been getting started with that the first couple of weeks. Um, we have relatively new callers, so making sure that they know not only what to say whenever we're going through these calls, but also how to say it and and why am I saying this? Um, that's kind of something that as a as the giving specialist, that I'm learning a lot of new things as well, and I am sometimes a little too particular. I like to have things over explained to me. Um, I'm also a firm believer in if you want me to do something the right way, show me what to do, but also kind of explain to me why we are doing things as well. Cause once I understand why something is important, I think it's a little bit easier to, to kind of buy into that there too. So. How many students are you supervising? How many, what size is the calling team? About a dozen. Um, so each night we have five callers. Um, we typically have a couple of alternates rotating in and out as well too. You know, going into the fall and into the, the, the colder weather, we have a lot of sickness going around. So we wanna make sure that our callers are safe. You know, they're, they're healthy physically, mentally. Um, so I try to be pretty flexible with, you know, hey, if 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 you are going to be out, try to let me know ahead of time. Um, because I because I because I again as a student employee my, myself, I benefited from having supervisors who looked out for me and who were willing to um kind of meet my needs if I needed to. So I want to be that for for my students as well. And again, oh, in the first couple of weeks in and we haven't had any major problems. Um, I'm gonna knock on wood and cross my fingers and all the other. <laughs> All the other superstitious stuff uh, for for that, but so about about twelve uh, callers, and then we have two student supervisors as well who um, are former callers who can um, help answer questions that the callers might have, and then they also kind of run behind the scenes, pulling data. Um, like I said, answering those text messages or those emails that we get coming into. So, and we kind of alluded to this earlier, but this isn't your first position at Northwest. You you previously were working in another area. So do you want to maybe talk about that? Maybe your previous experience before you started as the alumni annual giving. Yes, support. absolutely. So uh, for two years uh, before I took this position, I was a recruitment coordinator with the uh, admissions office. Um, I was the recruiter for the Kansas City metro area, really all of middle Missouri, and then also some of uh, southern Missouri as well, too. So that was a that was a great experience for me. Um, I love I love to network. I love to to meet new people. I love to share my passions. Um, it really helps that I was selling a product, quote, you know, air quotes on selling, um, you know, my passion for Northwest, even if I wasn't getting paid to tell people about it, I still would. Um, but it was a chance to um, meet with mostly um, traditional students. So, you know, high school juniors and seniors um, who were who were looking to take that next step and go to higher education. Um, I, I remember whenever I was a 16, 17 year old and I didn't really 
have a good idea of like what what really is college and what should I be thinking about and what am I not thinking about? Um, and so getting to see the excitement and the nervousness and the the uncertainty that all these students were experiencing uh, and getting to be a part of that uh, was really rewarding. I mean, I, I never want to take full credit for for recruiting somebody and being the reason that they're here, but there are some students that, that I, I did play a part in getting to meet with them either at their high school or at a college fair, or um, I gave them a tour, I gave them sort of a, a, a financial aid overview whenever they were here, uh, and just making those connections. You know, uh, I, I really want those students to feel like we we don't just see you for padding our numbers and padding our, you know, our, 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 our bank accounts or whatever. You know, we want you to succeed um, because we know that Northwest has helped us succeed. Um, so, that was something I did, I did for about two years. And before that, whenever I was in my undergrad, I was a student ambassador. Um, so I'd had some experience uh, with the admissions side of things. Um, but the strategy involved with, with recruiting a student, it's not anymore just you see a billboard uh, and you decide to go follow that billboard. I mean, for some people, it still is as simple as that. Um, but there's a lot of targeted marketing and messaging and um uh, the the sort of the the filter the funnel of you know if we can get students into these these milestones of um enrollment so their housing their financial aid their you know their their roommates that that <clears throat> kind of in, improves the likelihood that they will follow through and income to northwest so um my role in that as a recruiter was I'm not again I'm not just going to give you the things to do I want you to kind of understand why are we asking you to do these things mm -hmm. um I can't eliminate all of your anxiety and all of your fear, but I want to minimize it as much as I can, because again, I know what it's like to be a student who is kind of going through and you're like, is, is it really this easy? What am I missing? Um, so the, the time, my time as a recruiter was, was very fulfilling. I got to meet a lot of really cool students, a lot of really cool family members, um, a lot of other recruiters on the road um, and, and uh, just professionals in that field. Um, so I all, all past current and future era recruiters have my, have my respect for sure. <laughs> so before maybe do you have anything to share before you were a recruiter or as a student ambassador that maybe you thought the position was that maybe once you got into the position kind of surprised you if that it weirdly stated question makes sense so so things that um Maybe I was expecting to 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 have happen that didn't, or things or that I would or never vice guess, versa, or vice yep. versa. Um, so, as an ambassador, I started that whenever I was a like a sophomore. So I was nineteen, and uh, you know, I had the world world as my oyster. And for for me, I was very much I wanted to to be a good impression on those students coming in because I really wasn't that far away from them in terms of age. Um, what I learned pretty quickly, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, is I learned very quickly to not only learn the points on the tour of, hey, this is over here is our is our library. This is our uh, diversity and inclusion office. This is our tour room for for the residence halls. But I learned that each thing that we were talking about had a purpose. And and why does the student care that um, you know each each residential hall room comes with a dresser and a in a in a loft bed and, and the mattress has two sides to it, so you might want to flip it over. You know things like that. Um, because there's a there's a reason to it, and and you try to relate those facts to the person you're talking to, and everybody's different. So that adaptability that I learned from the job um, was was very important, and I carried that over to my recruitment position, and I'm uh, you know kind of grandfathering that into my current position. Um, because as a recruiter, you take the knowledge that you learned as an ambassador, and you amplify that. Because not only are you talking to one student at a time, um, you're talking to sometimes dozens or even a hundred students. Um, in one setting. And so you have to really fine tune your message. Um, why does why do students care that Northwest is affordable, that it's uh, all inclusive, that there are things for them to do here, that the faculty members are going to care about them? Because um, a lot of colleges, a lot of schools, a lot of universities have similar messaging. They have similar branding. Um, you can only say the same things over and over so many times. So, so really personalizing it to the student and making it relevant to them. Um, that was something that um, I didn't realize going in that I cared about personally as well, because I also am somebody that if I'm being asked to do something, if there's a project, if there's a, a research opportunity, I want to personalize it to myself as much as I can, because you take ownership of that. It, it kind of, it kind of um, 
seems a little more a little more uh, worth investigating, I think. Yeah, I think and that's it. being also a former recruiter who worked basically right. in the same territory. You, you had a few <laughs> more Kansas City schools than I did. But it is interesting taking when you transfer, when you know you take a different job on campus, you think, well, that admissions stuff doesn't. But it, it really does because you have to know so much about so many parts of the campus as an admissions rep that when you're doing a different job, that knowledge does not hurt. So I would imagine in the alumni house, <laughs> you probably get a lot of questions about things happening on campus that you know the answer to because – you were out trying to sell it to students for a while too. So, yes. and it's interesting you mentioned getting to know those other recruiters on the road because um, one of the recruiters I I saw at every college fair and we went to high school visits together. He's the director of career services at Missouri Southern now, so he's a, a professional colleague now too. So <laughs> you will probably run into people who are maybe in the foundation or in the alumni area of other schools that used to be recruiters too. And that's it's really cool how those connections kind of work. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've loved just seeing in the the world of higher education. I. I always kind of say, and this this can answer a future question of why did I come to Northwest, you know, um, but I, I always kind of say that I, I came to Northwest because I liked it, but I stayed and I'm still here because I really do love it. I really do love mm -hmm. the fabric that we have here, but higher education in general, you know, I, I think of ESPN College Game Day and two schools are, are rivals, but really when you get on this side of things with student success and programming and all of that, we are all in the same mission. We all have the same goal. Um, in, in preparing students for that long-term success or, or keeping our institutions um, in, a, in a position where they can offer that. And so, um, yeah, getting to see people within the university who have kind of moved around a little bit and had different positions in my time here, um, but then, yeah, networking with people from other uh, institutions as well has been really cool to see. And I do, you know, I root for those people because a lot of them do really good work. So uh, it's, it's cool to see that. Well, let's just uh, go right for the elephant in the room question of why Northwest? Like, take us back to that con confused, like, I mean, we're all <laughs> high school students who are confused, right? Like, yeah, we, right. Don't, we don't really know what life has for us, but what was your decision-making process that brought you here? Well, I think I think there's a bit of context that has to go into, if I can paint a picture for 16-year-old me, I was somebody that... Uh, I came from a really small, like one of, the, one of the smallest public schools in Missouri possible. I mean, if anybody has ever heard of New York R4, they, they have my respect instantly. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I think coming from such a small background and then in high school as well, I wanted to prove myself. I wanted to have the opportunities to expand my worldview and, and I wanted to do well at them as, as, uh, as well as that. So that kind of was a natural um, introduction to Northwest for me because we would have FFA contests for our district contests. We would have um, choir contests here. So things that I was already involved in brought me to campus and got me to see kind of what the, the campus looked like there. Um, I was a relatively high achieving student, not to pat myself on the back, but just, you know, that that provided some opportunities as well to, um, you know, interview for the president's scholarship and come back for some of the, the honors program um, uh, programming and things like that. But when it came to actually choosing a school and choosing a university, I was kind of arrogant with my, with my oh, let's just see what university reaches out to me and what they're going to offer me it, without really actually taking, taking charge of it. Um, and by the end of that time of my fall semester of, of high school, I was like, oh, well, that didn't really end the way I was thinking it was going to. But Northwest, what I've seen of it is, is very impressive. Um, at the time, I thought I was going to go into high school history education, and I knew that Northwest had a very solid education program. Uh, my brother was already attending the university, so I got to go and visit him and see the inside of the residence halls uh, and things like that. So it just sort of felt like a natural decision. Um, there were a couple of universities that shall remain nameless, but um, I decided off the bat I didn't want to go to just because I didn't like their mascots. Um, you know, in hindsight, that probably wasn't the, the best decision, but hey, the Bearcats are super, super cool, super cool family. Um, and, and, I, and I mean what I said earlier, that I, I came to Northwest and I liked it, but during my, my first couple of years here, my freshman, sophomore year, I really fell in love with it because of the people and the resources on campus that, that proved to me that I was going to be taken care of. And um, I didn't have to give up on some of those involvements that I had in high school um, that that Northwest had those opportunities and that there was recognition for that. There were uh, there were motivators for that as well too. Um, whenever I was doing well, that would that would skyrocket me, that would catapult me. And if I was struggling a little bit, if I needed help, there were people to kind of 
catch me and make sure, hey, you're okay, and we we want you to be okay um, to get you back to that that point. So that really, I think, sealed the deal for me, and you know, made me made me want to stick around North West. So. And so you mentioned maybe you thought about teaching high school. Was that your major? Were you an education major? Or did you switch during your time when you decided that wasn't what you wanted to do? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I, I came in as a as a social studies education major, and uh, you know it, it's got a one hundred percent placement rating for the students who go into that. So it's a very very great job security there. I think um, as as I went as a student, I realized that what I enjoyed about education maybe wasn't going to serve me as as well in a, a public education field. And I have all the respect in the world for our teachers, and I and I want to do everything I can to support them now uh, as a as a higher education professional. What I enjoy about education is the chance to grow as a person and the chance to, um, like I said earlier, increase your worldview and and uh, and that regard. So when I changed my mind, whenever I uh, ended up graduating, I thought, what if I stayed around a little bit longer and the opportunity to be a recruiter opened up and that served me really well because that kind of reinforced my love for higher education and seeing the passion that students had and, and setting them up for success in the future. Um, and, and just the, the exchange of ideas and the potential that people have to do great things while they're uh, in, in the university, uh, in, in schools. So um, it wasn't necessarily any fault of the university or any fault of the program that I was in. It was just kind of taking inventory of myself and knowing what do I enjoy doing? What are things that are, that are important to me? Um, what's going to be the best for my long-term physical and mental health, my long-term career, um, my opportunities to grow as a person as well. And it just kind of made sense to go into higher education from that point. So walk us through a little bit of your student employment experience. Like what made you want to be a student employee? What roles did you have? What things did you learn? A lot of really cool things uh, went into student employment. So, you know, growing up, I never really had an official after school job, I didn't really work retail or in, uh, you know, food service or anything like that, like a lot of high schoolers do. I had some summer jobs, you know, I was a lifeguard at our pool, uh, I would work for the farmers in the area and help them pick their their potatoes and things like that. Um, but student employment was really my first chance to to be an employee um, with set hours consistently throughout the year. Um, the first semester that I was on campus, I was a little too gun shy, I think, to, to to take that chance and say, well, who am I to, to work as a, you know, ticket uh, vendor at the, the football games or who am I to, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, but then after winter break ended and I came back, I saw a specific position open for, um, you guys know Bobby Bearcat, right? You guys know the, the Bearcat mascot that we have. He's walking around. Um, so Bobby and I got to be really good friends uh, with my first student employment job, if you, if you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but from there, but from there, the marketing department, marketing communications, um, asked if I wanted to also be an assistant for our event coordinator. Um, and so that just sort of snowballed into another job, which was, you know, setting up and tearing down and helping run events. And I learned, I really enjoyed being on that side of, of, of things that um, seeing something come together, um, having people ask me questions and getting to, to answer them and to be a, a resource for them was really cool there. Um, I was also, I mentioned a student ambassador. So that was another sort of event management and, um, interpersonal interaction with with prospective students and their families, um, being a good representation of the university. Um, I was a supplemental instructor as well for American government and politics for Dr. Brian Hess's section of uh, US politics and government. And that was a really cool experience as well, because Dr. Hess and I got to know each other um, personally, uh, as well as academically. So he would be asking me, hey, how can I be supporting the students to succeed in the class? But also, how can I be supporting you as my SI and as, you know, I, we become friends because of that, that interaction. So um, learning to build connections with, with professionals that can also be sort of, uh, yeah, mentor, mentee um, relationships and, and friendships there. Um, I just want very, to put a, yeah. a small plug in there for maybe, you know, as students, you think about the recruiting side, like as a high school student, like you don't understand really when you come to college, you get to be friends with your professors. Like these are yes. very smart and cool <laughs> and fun people for the most part. And like you, right. You, you're becoming an adult. They're also adults. Like you, you have the opportunity. They are your teachers, but they're also, you have this really cool 
professional sort of friendship with them as they support and mentor you through these educational processes. And, and honestly, like just getting to know so many professors and so many people who are really smart and really passionate about what they do. Like that's an underrated part of coming to college. I feel like people don't talk about that. They're like, you need to have a career. And I'm like, you need to make a lot of really smart friends. So anyway, that was a good plug for that. Go ahead. So, Travis. so hearing that story of, you know, what student employment kind of did for you, what advice do you have for students who maybe are looking for student employment jobs or they, maybe they want to be a cat caller or they want to be a student ambassador. You know, what's, what's the best way to go about? Cause we hear that a lot when we, when we talk with those first semester freshmen or those new mm-hmm. transfer students or those students that are, you know, they're brand new, they're mint green bear cats. They're, they're brand new. Um, they're getting a job on campus is one of those pain points. I feel like, cause they hear from the first time they visit, you know, jobs are hard to get on campus. There's, you know, 1200 jobs filled by 900 students or whatever the, the current stat that they say is that's kind of intimidating. Like it, it can mm-hmm. be a little overwhelming, I think to be like, you know, how do I actually put myself out there and get that job? So what advice would you have for somebody who maybe wants to be an SI leader or wants to be a cat caller or some of those other things that you have that experience with? That's a, that's a really good question. And I think uh, it kind of depends on, on your background a little bit and um, what your, what your core values about yourself and, and Mm -hmm. what you want out of the university is for me, like I said, I I wanted to chase those experiences and to, to kind of, you know, work my way up, um, the the system if you if you want to put it that way so um if if all the job is to you is these are a couple of hours of the week where i can get a paycheck and you know then then by all means yeah please please do that um let's be honest i mean i know 10 30 an hour for student employment like that's that's not that's not crazy but uh i do think for for me at least what my what i valued was working somewhere that i knew i was going to be taken care of um that would also balance my student life and then also having a personal life for myself too um, so I was okay with making a little bit less per hour to know that I was in a good in a good physical space and a good uh, headspace as well. So for those students who who want to get student employment experience, um, apply for those jobs. Uh, it doesn't have to be anything that's in your uh, current major. I know a lot of students ask me, "Well, I'm I'm a I'm a pre vet major, so can I go work out at the farm?" Well, you can, but those positions don't open up super quickly, as far as I'm aware. Um, but I also would say, let the job teach you some things, um, not only hard skills, you know, like answering the phones or, you know, processing things, but, um, find out if you like that or not, because again, that's what kind of shaped my decision to, to move away from the higher education or from the public education and try to go into higher education and go into some of the more, the more public facing, um, aspects of the job there too, because I enjoyed student employment. Um, I'm somebody who typically, uh, treats my decisions as very, uh, very permanent, even if they don't have to be permanent. So I want to make the best decision for myself. Um, so if I, if I could give advice to incoming freshmen, don't put the pressure on yourself. Like I did as a student that you can, you're allowed to try things out. Um, you're allowed to say, actually, you know what, this this probably isn't right for me. I don't know if I love this or not. And you don't have to, you know, prove anything to your supervisor or anything like that, but, but take the chance, you know, give yourself that 15 seconds of courage to hit the submit button, um, go to the mock interview days that career services provides. That way you can get some experience, um, going through interviews. Uh, I think, you know, as a, as a 18, 19 year old, I just, I couldn't know what I didn't know. You know, there's no way to, to, to figure all those things out until you experience it. So I do think that student employment at Northwest, especially, it gives you sort of a, a, a safety net for you're allowed to make a couple of mistakes, you know, maybe show up late to a shift. I don't recommend that, but there's a little bit more leniency. There's a little bit more of you, you can kind of learn those lessons now rather than have to go out into the, into the quote unquote real world and, and freak yourself out, you know, and psych yourself out with, with some of those things. Um, you were talking about networking and liking networking and kind of, you know, recruiting is networking. And honestly, where you're working now is networking. Can you talk to us about your thought process around networking and and what it is to you and and how can someone go about doing that? I suppose that's a that's a great question. And honestly, I I, I look at myself sometimes as a 24 year old, uh, you know, out of college and in grad school and all that, and I'm saying like I don't think my younger self would recognize me because, um, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier, I grew up in a really small community. Um, my world felt very small. And so for, you know, a couple of years, it was like, well, I've got to prove myself. Um, I, you know, was pretty, pretty shy. didn't really speak up very much. Um, and that changed probably towards the end of, of high school where I was 
getting involved in more things. And I was meeting people from other schools and other programs and, and who had opportunities for me um, post high school. Um, whenever I was in, in my undergraduate, I was part of a campus ministry where we would, you know, we'd talk to people about spiritual things and we'd try to um, get to know them there. But I think what really clicked for me with networking is that everybody's got a story. Um, and, and I like to, to ask people like, how did you get to where you are now? And was that, was that the plan? Cause it's comforting to know that people don't always end up where they planned to go. Um, it, just as uh, knowing me as a person, um, it, it provides some reassurance. So whenever I'm networking with somebody, uh, I, I want to get to know who do you, who do you feel like you are now? And, and looking back, did you, did you plan out exactly where you were going? Was there a, was there a 15 point plan that got you here? Um, were there some twists and turns along the way? Um, where, where do we have commonalities? I think that's a, that's a really important thing to me too, is where, what can we bond over? Um, if it's the Kansas city chiefs, if it's, um, we've been, both been to, to hiking trips in Colorado. Uh, if it's, we both have family who lives in Des Moines, you know, wh whatever it is, I think you can always find, um, something that connects you to that person. Uh, and then just wanting to follow up with that. It, it, um, takes a bit of the fear away. I mean, I know, again, thinking of a 14 year old me, and if I were to have to talk to somebody who was a, uh, a university president or provost, you know, I would think very much like, well, who am I to, who am I to, to approach this person? But now it's very much, uh, what, what can I learn from you? Um, what can I share with you that, that is important to me? Um, and uh, finding those connections, finding those commonalities there. And uh, I don't really know. Nobody ever really taught me how to network, if I'm being honest. I, I, I will admit, full disclosure, I did not attend speed networking when career services offered it. That is a regret of mine. Nobody um, else I did do. either. So it wasn't just you. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. But it, but it is it is a very um, important skill to have, I think, uh, to, to be able to make connections that either they can serve you in the future, or maybe it's just you have a good conversation with somebody. Uh, I I have people's business cards that I will probably never see again, but I had a good conversation with them. It hopefully left, left a lasting impression on them too. So, um, yeah. Well, we've been collecting data for a few years because that's kind of why we started this podcast was mm -hmm. just to explore people's career paths. And again, to check, like, did you have this plan? Did you follow this plan? And I could successfully say in all of our interviews with people, no one has followed the plan except one human and that was Ashley Black, bless her, had a 15 year plan and executed on it. So one of 100 and I know, so less than 1% of our sample here um, actually had the plan and followed through on the plan. Mm -hmm. Like everyone else has taken the road less traveled. So, well, and I think if I could speak to that for just a second, I think I'm not going to try to to put this on everybody that you've talked to because they could all tell their own stories. For me, a lot of that comes from, um, people pleasing tendencies and and self criticism i think that um oh well i should be at this point in my life right now and oh i should have taken this opportunity i should have known at 16 that i wasn't going to be a high school teacher you know um and and the more i talk to people and and hear these stories network the more it, it reminds me that we are all human and i know that that's a very worn out platitude maybe at some points but it really is true that um you're allowed to change your mind about things. You're allowed to, to, to not always know what's going on because a lot of people don't. Um, and that doesn't mean that we're all frauds. You know, imposter syndrome is rampant in, in my life and a lot of people that I am close with. Um, so you have permission to, to be somewhere that you didn't expect. And that's kind of exciting sometimes because it's a journey that you get to go on and it's an adventure. So I, it's, it's nice to know that 1% of our uh, podcast guests have the plan and I'm, I'm among, <laughs> I'm among friends here. So yes, you are. I think the other thing though, that brings out, you know, people pleasing tendencies. And I think too, the expectation about what it means to go to college has really changed in mm -hmm. the last even 20 years, 25 years. And I think young people feel like now I should, again, I should know what I am going to do. I should have this planned out. I should be X, Y, Z. And the truth is, like, there should be grace for that. We were all 16 once. We, mm -hmm. you know, have been 20, have been 24, and none of us had it figured out. It's just there wasn't social media around to tell us, like, you should have it figured out. So right. we were just bumbling through the world with, without knowing that's what we were <laughs> doing. So I just, I do feel like 
everyone being kind of interconnected and online and watching other people do things has sort of it's taken away some of that grace for the learning process and just mm. for being a, a young person who, you know, has ambition and maybe doesn't have exactly a direction for that. And you know what? It's okay. Like, so kudos to you for expressing that. And if I had to share that with, you know, listeners everywhere, it's okay to not know what mm. you're, you're doing. We're in career services. We literally did not choose a career. Mm. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, it's it's just a very humanizing and sort of like a, a big relief to just say, you know, like, here's where I'm working now. Here's what I'm interested in and what I'm passionate about. And, and it's OK if I want to try something new or take a different direction in the future. Um, that that is not reflecting, you know, on my inability to plan my own life out. Right. Right. Your worth as a human being is not connected to not what you decided to on go that. Yep. to college for as a, as, a, as a high school senior. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, none of us are in education, but I think we would encourage all of those young people, you know, new students, current students, incoming students, like, again, your worth is not contingent on what you study. Like, mm -hmm. just come here, learn with us. We're yeah. always learning. <laughs> and it's amazing um, in the yeah. course of the podcast, how many people it's somebody took an interest in them. Like a lot of the professors, it's like they didn't want it. They didn't go to college to be a college professor, but one of their professors saw something in them that was like, oh, you should do this or you should go mm -hmm. to grad school. And then they taught in grad school and they found out they loved it. So it's, you know, people is, is more important. You know, I think it's who you know is just as important as what you know when we've all heard Absolutely. that forever. Absolutely. But it really is. I mean, it's true because it's, you never know you don't know what you don't know. And until, you know, you meet people and see what they do and, you know, find out what you like and what you're interested in, like, you just don't have an idea. So, and, and that leads scary. me into a question too, because you mentioned grad school and like, we're both actually in the same grad program. We're in Stratcom. Yes. So, yay. So um, I'm always interested, you know, why you chose to pursue that. You, you were a lot closer to your original graduation than I am, of course. <laughs> so, um, so I'm interested, you know, what was the motivating factor to sign up for that relatively new program over in Wells Hall? Absolutely. So uh, with, with I, I don't think I ever really even clarified earlier. So my, my, my bachelor's degree is in history and political science. And uh, I, I really did think about that for a while of, you know, with, with history, do I plan to go into research? Do I plan to go into to teaching at the collegiate level? And at the time it was just sort of up in the air, but I was like, you know, again, with strategic communication, um, I really like people. I like talking to people. I like networking. I like being forward facing. So it seemed like a pretty logical um step for me to, to be able to go into something that gives me the tools to communicate effectively. Uh, I think a lack of communication and um, not understanding your audience and having the risk of your audience not understanding your message, those are um, becoming more and more common, unfortunately, I think. Okay. So so being able to go into this program, um, a lot of really, really awesome professors, and then my my cohort is, is very interesting to, to talk to as well. So uh, I mean, full disclosure, I'm not entirely sure what that will look like for me in the, in the next five or 10 years, um, but I, I do see a lot of value in um, recognizing a, an effective message, conveying it clearly, um, being, able, able, being able to understand the audience that you're talking to, because if you go into something, uh, if you go into a project, if you go into a campaign, if you go into uh, a community and... Um, messages are unclear. Uh, there's there's not um, a dialogue going on. That's where a lot of tension can happen, a lot of uh, miscommunications and, and unfortunate things there. So um, in my professional life, it's definitely important, but then also in you know my personal life, you know, I think about spiritual communities. I think about um, networking. I'm, a, I'm an aspiring singer songwriter. That's kind of my, my personal trivia there. So um, how can I communicate effectively as a singer, as a, as a person of faith, as a professional? Um, I think that those are all very very useful things so hmm. what a what an interesting and sort of like often untalked about professionally connection right like here's mm -hmm. how my education is making me a better human right not just yeah. not just for my work not for my career but like for everything in my life absolutely yeah and i think that's what drew me to the program too is like 
it, it seemed to direct, to apply the most to what I'm professionally doing and I don't plan to leave what I'm doing, but it also, you know, so not only are you getting the degree, which is important, you know, it's hard mm-hmm. sometimes to move up without certain degrees, especially in a college or a university setting, but then it's also something that's interesting that applies universally to everywhere in life. So, yeah. So, and well, I think, and I think that um, with, if I, if I evaluate personal relationships that I have with people being in this program has helped me to see, Oh, here is why, this person and I have had a disagreement before, mm-hmm. and here's how we can effectively come around huh. um, uh, to, to something, or, or with myself, my own inner dialogue. I mentioned earlier the imposter syndrome, and in the class that I'm taking right now, I've learned that's a logical fallacy. That mm-hmm. you know, so so there really are some really cool practical experiences, and I think um, you know, you were mentioning earlier, Hannah, that that a lot of people are are kind of scared to pick the wrong major because mm-hmm. they think I have to know something that will will make me a lot of money or will get me the fastest job. But it really is about, to me, it's about, it's, it's very hard to not make a journey into a task. I, I tend to do that to myself and I can acknowledge that I, I make things into tasks where if I do X, Y, Z, then A, B, C will happen. And what has really worked out for me the best is to say, this is a journey. I don't have to know where this is all going to take me. But if I am receptive to networking with people, understanding how to communicate, um, taking risks and maybe going outside of my comfort zone. Those are the things that have, that have done well for me rather than, okay, I have to major in business finance or else I won't get a job that I want. You know, it's, it's a very, it's a very um, difficult thing to, to give yourself permission to do um, because it is scary. There's a lot of unknown, but if you, if you have the courage to do that, I think it will reward you. Hmm. Absolutely. That's really good. And we're certainly glad that that journey's brought you here and brought you yes. to to the alumni association, you know, the Absolutely. alumni house and the job that you have now. So we want to be respectful of your time. So thank you so much for being here today. And we really appreciate it. Yeah. I thank appreciate you. you guys having me on. All right. Well, that will do it from the episode of Behind the Bearcat. And we'll talk to you next time. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, be sure to give us a thumbs up below. That helps out. Also, if you've not done so yet, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss a new episode. Also, we'd love to connect with you on social media. You can find Behind the Bearcat on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Plus, the audio podcast comes out on Fridays on all the major podcast platforms. Thanks again for watching Behind the Bearcat, and as always, we'll talk to you next time.